Uh, well, let's have a word of prayer as we begin our class. Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for drawing us here this morning, Lord, and uh, thank you for your love for us and your mercy, your grace. Thank you that you are a sovereign God, that you are omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. And thank you, Father, that we can uh, even have the privilege of coming before you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who made a way possible for us to come. For us, it is a throne of grace. And it's at that throne where we find your mercy and your grace at our deepest point of need. Lord, I want to thank you for everyone in the room this morning. <clears throat> They're so special to me. I thank you for their love for you and for their love for your word of truth. And Lord, our, our, our desire this morning is to learn from you through your word of truth. And to that end, we will commit our class to your care and pray it in your son Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, we have taken a side trip, I guess, a little bit from 1 Thessalonians when we uh, read Paul's comment in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.18 that he wanted to come back and, and see them, but Satan had hindered him. And that sort of triggered a thought in my mind that uh, I think we ought to know something at least about his, the way that he tries to attack believers. And that frankly, this is such a broad area of study that... Um, <laughs> Somehow I'm going to have to get out of it this morning. Uh, we, I'd like to come back and do that study, uh, finish that study rather, uh, some other time. Um, I think uh, one good study would be when did sin enter the world, and God's creation. Obviously, uh, Satan was already in the uh, garden when uh, Adam and Eve fell. When did that happen? Um, and why did it happen? We should remember that uh, Satan was created as, as the highest and most beautiful of all cherubs. And I, one of my personal thoughts is that somehow he looked at himself in the mirror and began to think too much of himself. And ultimately he decided he needed to replace God. And that got him cast out of heaven, of course, and now he's God's mortal enemy, and ours as well. But that's for another time. Uh, there are two critical passages that deal with that because if we didn't have those two passages, we would not know when sin entered the world. And so, uh, but that's for another time. We've, we've looked at several uh, ways that he attacks us. And uh, the last one we talked about, and I think this is really a big one, and that is through lack of forgiveness in church. And most of that, of course, revolves around... Um, church discipline and how the how the approach how a church actually truly approaches church discipline the ultimate end of church discipline is not destruction it is restoration and unfortunately some churches don't follow that they do not abide by God's word so in the end they just basically throw that person out and say you're done you're out of here and we don't want any part of you anymore that's not the way it's supposed to be and so um we looked at how, how we really are supposed to do that. So now, uh, in, in, if you get your outline then, I, I put there, know your enemy. And uh, we ought to remember that he has this in his crosshairs um, of his scope. We ought to remember that he, ch he, he studies us every day. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our vulnerabilities. And um, I can remember back when I was in the Army, and I'm, I'm not sure if that was the War of 1812. I can't remember. It was somewhere back there. But when I was in basic training, the last week of that uh, training was, uh, was given to bivouac, what they call bivouac, and it was seven days of war games. And um, I, I remember a great deal of it, about it. I can remember that we had to, we marched about 15 miles to where we were going to uh, play the games. And by the way, they were serious. It wasn't games. And uh, we had to wear our full field pack, and it was in a, like a horseshoe roll, and it weighed just between 70 to 75 pounds. And if you did not get that thing perfect on your back, you were going to have struggle with marching 15 miles. So when you got out there and began the exercises, we went through every possible uh, imagine a uh, scene that you might have playing these games that were actually 
or. And I can recall a couple things that uh, they kept hounding us every day. Three things they said. Number one, know your weapon. Know what your weapons are. Number two, know how to use your weapon. That's a pretty good idea. And number three, know something about the person or the enemy that you're going to use those weapons on. I got to thinking that that's really the same way we ought to look at Satan. Know him through the scriptures. Know what he's about because he is our moral enemy. For you and I as believers, of course, um, while I, and I've said this time and time again, and I just keep repeating it, he has lost us for eternity. He's not lost us for time. And his great desire and goal for each one in this room is to wreck our testimony, shipwreck our faith. And he will put roadblocks before us. He'll do everything he can to do that. And uh, throughout history, there's probably been two kinds of errors uh, with regard to Satan. Those who have taken him too seriously. So that, um, <clears throat> especially in the Middle Ages, um, it was, it, they actually, monks actually removed themselves from society. And moved out into caves and other dark places like that to do battle with Satan. It was called dodging Satan exercises. People would bring them food, but they never left those caves because their whole philosophy was you, somehow we have to get a victory over Satan. So that was, that was in that day. And uh, it was, unfortunately, it was during that time, and we're going back hundreds and hundreds of years, that a theory on the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on a cross, was called the ransom to Satan theory. And what they meant by that was that Christ's death on the cross was a payment to Satan to buy back the children who were caught and trapped in sin. Obviously through uh, Adam's uh, uh, fall. And uh, consequently they fell at peace with God. Actually the payment was made to the living God, not Satan. Somehow we put him too high up. But it was God's wrath that needed to be propitiated and his, his justice. And of course, he provided his own sacrifice through his son Jesus Christ, his own propitiation. But that theory lasted almost a thousand years. Think about that that they had bought into that because they got so involved. They, consequently, they lost, a, as I say, they lost their peace with God and they forgot the triumph of Calvary. When Christ said, um, now, the, uh, now this world has been judged, now the rule of this world shall be cast out in John 12, 31, that was a historical statement. In fact, you don't, read, you don't need to turn here for me, but listen to Colossians 2, uh, 13, through 15. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the circumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions, having canceled out the cert certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which were hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way. That, listen, that's all, basically all the law. And it just kept piling up against us because we were sinners and we had no way out. But it says here he has taken, out, taken it out of the way. In verse 14 he says, having canceled out the certificate of death. That word for cancel in the Greek has the idea. Back in Paul's day they would write things on something like a, we would, we would call it chalk today. But they would write it, and, but they didn't have any, um, any acid in the ink or, or whatever. And so you could wipe it off and there was never a trace of it left. And that's exactly what happened to our sins. I know this is a side thought, but he says, you're dead. You have no way out. He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And as Linsky said, they stayed there. That is my sins. In verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Now, that, again, that was a historic event. So, for us, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. While we know that Satan is our moral enemy, while we know that he is doing all that he can to undo us, 
if we take him too seriously, then, then he becomes our whole life. We become obsessed with him. So there was that, there was that period, and by the way, that period was also called the Dark Ages, remember? And that was the sole reason, because they had a wrong philosophy or a wrong theology of who Satan was and how powerful he was. And then, of course, as time went along through the age of enlightenment and, and rational, uh, rationalism, um, they, they decided there wasn't any Satan. That was, that was just a makeup thing. So they didn't take him seriously enough. Um, what's interesting to me is while they, while they have said that and believe that, there's been a rise in occult practices over the past 25 to 50 years. And Satanism is just growing by leaps and bounds, right? Now they're in our schools. I watched a, um, a video maybe six or eight months ago, and it, I don't know that you call it a debate, but it was, a, it was the president of child evangelism <clears throat> and the leading Satanist. By the way, please remember, they are absolutely atheists. And they're using this, this occult called Satanism as a guise to push their atheistic uh, philosophy all over. Of course, now they're getting to schools, right? Middle schools, high schools, and all the rest. And what I say, if it, and of course, and then they try to pass it off and say, well, we don't, we don't really worship Satan himself. We worship our own ideals. Well, if you don't worship Satan, change your name. That wouldn't be hard to do. So now we're, so we went through this period where we don't take him seriously enough. Now there's been a rise in, um, in those who um, now decided that, that they have to do battle with Satan again, right? So now you have the spiritual warfare movement. And we look for, we look for devils and demons everywhere, behind shrubs. Um, I've done some, some study on... Uh, on the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, by the way, you should know again, I've probably said this before, that it is sweeping the world. It is the fastest growing movement within quote-unquote Christianity in the world. There's now almost five million in America who are lined up with Bill Johnson and his minions. They have what they call spiritual mapping, spiritual warfare. Some of them even wear military uniforms as you go into cities seeking for demons that they can find that may be in control of that uh, city. You should also know that many of them were involved with Donald Trump in his last election. Some of you probably already know that, right? If, did you ever see any of the pictures of clergy praying for him? They were not our people. And uh, one of their leading spokesmen came to the conclusion that God had decreed and only wanted one man for the office, and that was Donald Trump. And of course, Trump did not win the election. Now this was a prophecy. So, so finally he, he finally broke down and wrote a, an apology. Of course, you know, they have these prophetic statements they make, revelations, because they believe that they're on par with the original 12, and now they're up to about 370. I don't know how in the world the Lord is going to find room for their name on the... Uh, foundation, right, in the, in the city. The 12 apostles of the Lamb, now it's got to be about 400. So God's going to have to change some names and add some, right? Um, and so he wrote a letter of apology. Then someone came along, well, wait a minute, Donald Trump is contesting the election. So he erased it, he deleted it off. It's, it, it, listen, it's crazy. And their battleground, look with me in first Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 10. Because these are a couple of their main primary verses. And look, I've, I've just touched on what they're doing. I made myself watch, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with Bethel Redding, right? Church, Johnson's Church. I forced myself to watch their um, Tunnel of Fire last night. You can YouTube it. And I thought, what in the world is that? What it is is they have this long line of quote unquote longer or older believers. And, and, so, and then the younger believers walk through that line to get their anointing on each side. 
Some of them were teenagers. Falling on the floor, barking like dogs, writhing around on the floor, lying in a fetal position. Some of the young gals were going through the birthing process. Now, who do you think is in control of that? <coughs> I can tell you it's not. It's not a living God. Are you familiar with um, Spencer Smith? That's not a name I'm familiar with. He's a Baptist missionary. He, um, he has a YouTube channel, and he has a whole series that he just put out, I don't know, the last year. The fourth installment just came out. I think it's his final one. Anyway, the first one's called, it's the Third Adam series. And it's the <coughs> you're talking about. It's warning about all these churches. It's about Mystery Babylon and your enemy yeah, and yeah. how it's playing out today, and it shows snippets from all these churches. But it's, mm -hmm. I sent it to Scott months ago, and he said, I watched it, and I was just like, everybody needs to watch this. And he said, well, you're the third person this week that sent it to me. So mm -hmm. it's really good. I highly recommend it. Yeah. The whole just to make you aware of how this is playing out in the world. I mean, you go to, we have friends going to a church in Hilliard that I was concerned about already. I'd never been there, but I watched two of their whole sermons, the whole worship service, and took typed four pages of notes of the stuff that wasn't biblical to share with my friend. But then I watched his stuff, and what he was talking about was happening at that church, the yeah. Kundalini spirit being manifested through people. And yeah, we were at our... Non-biblical Stuff. It is, but the and the yeah, scary it part is that no, and it's not. You know what? I was uh, we were over to celebrating our great granddaughter's youngest uh, birthday yesterday, <clears throat> and my uh, uh, grandson-in-law, very sharp, told me that he had just pulled a couple out of NAR, and I said, "Oh my word, you did!" He said, "I did," because he's very up on. All, oh, he's way beyond me as far as, um, and so. I got to thinking of Jude. I'm going to let him know. He, listen, we went through Jude before. But in Jude 22 and following, have mercy on some who are doubting. Now, I believe that's young believers, and I think that's who Nathan was involved with. They're confused, and they're not sure. They're open to just about anything and everything as far as teaching can, is concerned. And these people are that, that uh, Jude is talking about are have gotten their toes in the water. And if somebody does not rescue them, guess what's going to happen, right? They're going to they're going to be going through that line. So he says, "Have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire." So these people have already gotten caught up in it. And as, as, as strong, mature believers, I believe with all of my heart, if we, have the, if we have the opportunity, if God presents that, we have a responsibility. Now, obviously, you have to be careful, very careful, because these people have already partake, partaken. So he says, snatch them out of the fire. Get them out of there. On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. You know what the word pollution means in Greek? Soiled underwear. If you ever want to know what God thinks of false teachers, take a look at that verse. And, and when he says, ha, uh, ha, uh, on, um, uh, and on some have mercy with fear, the fact of the matter is we can get burnt. But we have a responsibility. And thank God that Nathan had that opportunity and he jumped all over it. And that couple got out of there. I mentioned this book to Randy the other day, and it's, a, it's probably the definitive work that I've seen before. Holly Pivik is her name. She's a graduate. She has a master's degree in apologetics. And then the other fellow that worked with her is a um, philosopher, Christian philosopher. They're both from... Uh, Talbot Theological Seminary, and they wrote this book entitled uh, Counterfeit Kingdom. And uh, that's a, that's a must-read, and basically I'll lay it down, especially for those who are in leadership. She has exposed, now listen, it's a long read, because the stuff they're doing is satanic. It's voodoo Christianity, that's what I call it. And they can jump me all they want to. 
that I that I hate them. That I, listen, I can listen. I can remember back years ago. Maybe you all did. Anybody remember when Benny Hen threatened to shoot uh, John MacArthur with a Holy Spirit machine gun? <laughs> you can YouTube that. It's not funny. He was walking up and down the stage going like this. I'll shoot him. I can't find that verse, but if I find it, he's dead. Think about that, because John MacArthur uh, challenged his aberrant teaching. So Nathan, bless his heart, was strong enough to get those kids rescued out of that mess. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. These are some of their battle, call, uh, battle cries. Paul says, and by the way, Paul is in the midst of defending his apostleship once again. And so you have to follow him especially carefully in this book. Uh, in verse 3, and we're just going to jump. Well, let me, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll read beginning with verse 1. Now, I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent, I ask that when I am present, I may be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as, regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, the fact of the matter is, these were the super apostles who were attacking Paul's person and his apostleship. And unfortunately, Paul had to spend almost all of 2 Corinthians to defend himself. Now, I'm not an apostle, so I can't do that, but I will defend myself if someone jumps me. Biblically. So they come to these verses, in verse 4 he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of uh, fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now they use that as, by the way, I don't see any people in here, and I don't see any demons. But these verses are some of their battle cry verses. But he's not talking about people. He's not talking about demons. He's describing a battle against evil ideas, thoughts, and arguments. Fortresses made up of satanic lies. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to text Nathan, too, about that. Because people are caught up in that. False doctrine. They're victims of it. Ideas trapped and imprisoned by false doctrine. Evil systems of thought. And the point of the warfare is to liberate them from that. And yet they use these verses to go demon inspecting. <laughs> Do you know who's laughing about that? Our buddy called Satan. Um... Let me just give you, just remind you a few things about, and we're going to try and get to the point where we can close with Romans 16. But just a few things about Bill Johnson. And by the way, every, every one of these apostles, and they're growing because they believe the fivefold ministry of Ephesians 4, apostles and prophets, are alive and well today. And they're the ones, the new generation of prophets and apostles. By the way, the churches who align themselves with him can do nothing unless the apostle comes and tells them what to do. Including the pastor of that church or the board of elders, it would make no difference. If you have any kind of major decision to make in that church, you have to hold that decision until they get there and give you some kind of a prophetic statement. Now that would include, by the way, Paula White, you heard of that name, right? Yeah, well, she's, she's one, too. She's, she's, a, she's an apostle. So here are just some of the things. Um, he was not divine before the Holy Spirit came up upon him in his baptism. Up until that time, he was not divine. Obviously, look with me in John 1. Obviously, he has no use for John 1, 1 through 3. Right? And I'm just going to answer some of those questions. Those things. He believes that Christ was not God until the Holy Spirit came upon him in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing uh, came into being that has come into be, uh, to being. In the, in the first part, this, by the way, Genesis begins creation, right? 
But job begins before creation. In the beginning was continuing the Word. And the Word was continuing with God. In other words, there was never a time when Jesus Christ was not God from eternity past. And yet Johnson says, no, that's probably not true. He probably did not come, become divine until he was baptized. He had to be born again through his resurrection. And the reason for that is because so that we can do, we can do the same miracles he did, according to Bill Johnson. Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. Well, once again, he must, be, he must not like John's gospel. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my, of my own accord. Um, I can take it up. I can lay it down. This commandment I receive from my Father, John 10, 17, and 18. So he teaches a false Christ and a false hope. I'm going to say it again until my tongue rots out. Those young people cannot be saved under his ministry. That's an impossibility because he is teaching them a defective Christ. Uh, it, it, you know, it's uh, I don't even I don't even know how to I don't even know how to uh, respond to some of this sus. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. And by, so they'll all be wrapped up in this one that's coming, right? He's not here yet, but he'll come. The Spirit's already there. Of which you have already have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. That's 1 John 4, 1 through 4. He ignores the Scriptures. He's like Benny Hinn. One night on the stage doing, doing battle with the devil, and he waved for 30 minutes. He waved his Bible at him. Be gone, Satan, and never opened that book. He so emptied himself, Christ, that he was incapable of doing what was required of him by the Father without the Father's help. Now look, I came up with about a thousand verses, so <laughs> turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We will confine this to just a few verses to answer him back. I hope he's listening. No, I don't, I don't care about that. What I do care is that what, what we think about Jesus Christ means everything, Right? Everything. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with uh, verse uh, 23. And Jesus was going about in all, the, all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaim, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria, and they brought to him all who were taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now there's tons and tons. You, you all know exactly what I know. But see, what he, what he is doing here is putting himself up, up, up on the same level as Jesus Christ. Men like Bill Johnson. And what they do is they twist the scriptures, which... Peter talks about in, in 1 Peter 3.16. They distort the word of God to get, to, to get their uh, philosophy out to people. He criticizes Christians who rely more on the Bible than the Holy Spirit. He says that most Christians operate under a false belief that the Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. And it's difficult to get the same fruit as the early church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have. So he says Christians don't need doctrine, they need the manifest presence of God. <laughs> well, wow, I don't even know how to respond to that except to say that in Acts 2.43, everybody was following the teachings of the apostles. 
and throughout the scriptures, preach the word in season, out of season. You were born again, not a seed which is imperishable, but, or perishable, but imperishable. That is the living and abiding word of God. That doesn't fit for him. And any of the rest of them, Mike Bickle, and the rest. So that's Bill Johnson. That's what they believe. And I think I said there, number eight was know your enemy, and we do need to know him. We ought to know how he seeks to undo us, right? And I said what not to do. Well, don't, don't get involved with the spiritual warfare movement. That is exactly what he wants us to do. You see, it, it, a thousand years ago, they were obsessed with the devil. And now today, we're obsessed with the devil. There's two things we ought to all be obsessed with. Number one, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the empty tomb. And not the devil. He's a defeated foe. Now, for some unscrutable reason, God has given him a pretty long chain until he throws him into the lake of fire. He has been judged. He was judged as crossed. He's in a state of judgment right now. And then finally, he will be cast into the lake of fire. So it's that period between where he does all that he can to undo us. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I've just given you part of it. They might. I, I found several, by the way, in our churches in Columbus. I just Google it. And I, listen, I, I, I mean, I got heart sick. Because of what that means. And I think there are multitudes of Christians that don't, don't have any idea. Maybe someone even in their own family, like the, the couple that Nathan was able to break free from that. I think it's interesting that Holly Vivek, who was the main author of this book, Counterfeit Kingdom, she fell in love with a fellow who was involved in a NAR church. <laughs> what he didn't know is he messed around with the wrong lady, <laughs> theologically. And the, uh, the closer, you can read, if you get the book, you can read it, because it's, you, can get, you can get a Kindle, by the way, which is under $10. And uh, she finally told him, she said, you know what, we, this is not going to last because we're from two different theological worlds. So she began to tell him all that she had found out about NAR. Well, our church does not do that. She said, are they part of NAR? They are. And I don't know what she, she may have said in the book, and I don't recall. I, but I do know this. Finally, his church did do that. And out the door he went, and they got married. And so they're working together today. That's a victory. That's a big victory because she was not about to marry him. And she explained to him why. And um, you see how easy it is for Satan to work? He, you, he'll use every trick in the book. Every trick. He'll use people like Bill Johnson to, to uh, spread his evilness all over the world. And people become attracted to it. I saw why the world out there that we live in, that's his world, is so attractive, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, Paul gives us the, uh, the approach in, in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. He says, finally, he's wrapping things up now. He says, be strong in the Lord. By the way, that's all in the passive tense. In other words, be made strong in the Lord. If I'm going to get victory over Satan, it's going to have to come from outside myself. Because I am not strong enough in my own flesh, if you will, even as a believer, to do battle with him. So Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand, be able to stand firm against the schemes of of the devil. For our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist, noticed. Don't go out and do battle with him. Resist him. In the evil day, having done everything, stand firm. So it's not like I put on my football uniform and play a game and then take it off and put it back on again. This is a once only time. You just simply need to keep it on once for all. It's my life, uh, lifelong companion. Uh, back to Jude uh, chapter 24, or uh, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. So our strength is in Him. The devil has a master. In fact, I probably should have finished uh, 1 John 4. I only want, to cut, I only want three verses, but... Paul says, you, in, in 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And that's Jesus Christ. So the devil has a master. But I have to be in submission to my master. The day I think I can go out and do battle with, the, with Satan but on my own, in my own flesh, is the day of my defeat. And these people have no clue what they're up to. Do you really think that you can confine Satan to Columbus, Ohio? Or Los Angeles? So, I had this comment or statement from one of the uh, NAR guys. He wrote a book, Jericho's Victory. You remember when they went around the walls of the city? So he is advocating you go to the cities and you march in and through the cities looking for Satan and his, de his demons. Now, I don't know about Los Angeles, but I can tell you this much. There's 3,500 miles of, of, of streets in the inner city of Chicago. If you're driving around 55 miles an hour, how long is that going to take? And oh, by the way, the ones you're looking for in Chicago may be out in L.A. You see how crazy it is? But you see how powerful he is and how he, he plays mind games with people? That's why, that's why Paul uses the word schemes. Or in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, to a new believer, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So I've said before, I'll say it again, just as God has a plan for our lives, so does Satan. He knows he can't win. And he's dumber than a box of rocks. But the fact is, he still keeps trying. And along the way, he causes us to stumble if we allow him to. See, if the enemy were bacteria, then you could just go somewhere and get a shot. But this is different. Incidentally, we don't have time to go through all these, but notice after Paul says in... Um, in Ephesians 6, 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God that you may be able, to, be able to resist the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore having, verse 14, having girded your loins with truth, truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, Paul is comparing this, uh, our armor with a Roman soldier. You ever seen pictures of the old Roman soldiers when they get went out to battle? Well, they had, two different, they had two different shields. One was about four foot high, maybe two foot wide. You've seen those, and they stood behind them as they marched. So that when the enemy's fiery darts or arrows would come at them, they would bounce off. What a picture. The other one was, was they had on their arm, and, and, or, or they would be in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and, and, and they would uh, parry the uh, 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 thrusts of, of the enemy. Listen, when that Roman soldier went out to war, that guy was really ready with all of his armor. They had their, their, their feet were shod with like cleats so they could walk anywhere they wanted to. That's kind of the picture Paul's giving here. 
<coughs> he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's, that's the way I live my life daily. That's not my justification righteous, righteousness when I got saved. This is my daily walk with the Lord in righteousness. Having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Now, I, let me just give a word to Benny Hinn and Bill Johnson. Do me a favor. Open the book. Open the book. That's what Paul's talking about. Know it and know it well and live it. If you're going to have victory... Have you ever thought about what Paul's armor might, must have looked like? Because everybody was firing darts at him, right? Fiery darts. Can you imagine what Paul must have looked like through all that he went through in his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know what he said at the end of his life, right? I mean, this is the first time I read this, I wept. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Now, all you have to do is go back to Acts 9. When Paul trusted Christ on the road to Damascus, and the Lord said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the gospel's sake, and now he's at the end of his life. And he's standing there, well, actually Nero's about to chop his head off, but victorious. He says, don't worry about that, what he's going to do to me. I'm taken off, and I'm taken off for heaven. So that's how it goes. Um, that, that's how we do it. Uh, obviously, we have a fearsome enemy, and we do, but there's no reason to be fearful because when we're protected by God's uh, wonderful armor. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. We ought to acknowledge that, the fact that he does have... Um, listen, we're all going to get up tomorrow morning, the hope. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, in a sense, I, I suppose I think about what my day's going to be like. It's changed a little bit since I don't work anymore. Um, and the fact of the matter is, he's got plans for my day. He does. So, um, in 1 Peter 5, 8, Paul, or Peter says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Did you know that word in the Greek is the very same word uh, that was used of the drowning of the uh, Egyptians in the Red Sea? So basically what he's saying there is he wants to devour and, and drown our testimony, our Christian life. Now, I don't know about you, but I do take uh, uh, comfort in verse 9. But resist him. There it is again. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being uh, accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Let's not, I, I don't go through this alone. There's others that have to go through this as well. And that, that's, that's a sense of comfort to me. In James chapter 4, <clears throat> Verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's nothing there for him. For that believer who is walking, in, 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 who has his armor on, who is, who's prayed up, and by the way, it's interesting that when you get through uh, Ephesians 6, and I... I forgot about that. But when, when Paul gets finished with all the armor, he, he, what, what does he undergird it with in Ephesians 6, 18? With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with, that, with this in view, beyond the alert, with all perseverance and, and uh, petition for all the saints. 
That's a pretty big deal. So Paul undergirds it all prayer. You can put on all your armor, you can do all those things, but listen, if you don't have a very, if you don't have an, a, a strong prayer life, then you still could be undone by the old boy. Forget this red flannel that, you know, that everybody thinks he wears and going around with a tail. That's what he wants you to think. He wants you to think all of those crazy things about him. But he is a mortal enemy of the living God, and he is a mortal enemy, enemy of ours. And he is relentless. Any questions? Turn with me to Romans chapter 16, and then we will close with this. And then we will go back to, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, um, beginning next week. You know, it's, it's interesting that the early apostles and the writers of Scripture over and over and over again uh, warn us about the Bill Johnsons of this world. They had them in Paul's day, just a different name. They had them in Peter's day. Why do you think Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Listen, one thing that Satan can accomplish through a false teacher is they sound very winsome, very sweet. But you've got you to listen to what they're saying and you've got to look at their lifestyle. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, plastic words, words that they can twist around like a piece of clay and make it fit whatever they want it to. Their judgment, by the way, uh, from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Take note of that. Well, anyway, in Romans 16, uh, verses 17 through 20. And every phrase in these verses are critical for our understanding about our present day, day situation. Now, I urge you, Paul says, I urge you, brethren, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm, I'm rejoicing with you, verse 19, rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So this was not just some... Uh, difference of interpretation of a passage of scripture that you know that's you know you and I might debate certain things well, when Christ is going to return the rapture of the church all those great things we love to debate about but this was divisiveness and polarization hindrances setting and baiting traps of offense is exactly what those words mean contrary to teaching contrary to what apostolic teaching they were instructors of heresy. They were knowingly subverting, subverting the truth of God. Why was that happening? Verse 18. Notice what it says. Such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And that's what they do. They're, they're driven by self-gratification. They don't have any interest in, in submitting themselves to Jesus Christ's lordship. That's not their interest. Their interest is what they're trying to pass off. Financial gain. Well, look, we don't need to read about that, and we've done that one time and time and again. Money, 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 money. I cannot get enough of it. The love of money is what? The root of all evil. It sure is. By the way, this dollars I got my wealth, there's nothing wrong with that. It's if I fall in love with that. I can't because I don't have that much, but, but you know what I'm talking about. And that's what he's saying. It's their own gratification they're after. And they always, they always use flattering speech, smooth. They, 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 truth has, listen, truth is way down the list anymore. Way down the list. 
But Isaiah says to the law and the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, they, they have no dawn. In other words, they're in darkness. Isaiah 8, 20. So, um, they, de they deny the central tenets of the, of, of the gospel. We've already talked about 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Such men are false apostles. Now, we've already gone over the New Apostolic Re uh, Reformation and compared them to the biblical description of a true apostle. I want you to know that Paul absolutely cleared himself, uh, 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 believed that he was the last. As he goes through uh, the apostles and uh, the sightings of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, then he appeared to, the, to James and, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were to an untimely born, he appeared to me also, last. For I'm the least of the apostles, that wouldn't fit today's apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of 1 Corinthians 15.10, by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. That would not fit an apostle today. Not at all. They would laugh at that. Well, that was Paul. Paul was weak. That's not today's apostle. We're strong. We get to tell you what, how to live your life. We're that strong. So the fact of the matter is they were a smooth talking of the gullible in Rome. Notice in, in verse 18, such men are slaves, not of Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. It did not take me very long to understand how important my, my personal life and walk with the Lord and his word was going to be with young teenagers in Kenton 50 years ago. This is no pat on my shoulder, but some time ago I got a note from one of those kids thanking me for being so faithful to God's Word. Fifty years. And yet there are multitudes being sucked in by this stuff. And that's exactly what goes on. They're gullible. They need help. They need Bible teaching from the very beginning, from the get-go. And when we leave them out there by themselves as new believers, they're, listen, Satan comes along and fills up whatever need they want, right? He does. So, smooth talking. How did they handle it? Well, notice what he says. Um, keep a cloak, in verse 17, keep your eye on those. That word, scopio. Get your telescope out. <laughs> Look them over. That's what he's saying. I would, I would think it would probably begin with the church leaders. Take steps to block any inroads to protect fellow believers. I would take that person or those personages back to a, a, a back room and sit down with them. I remember when, when um, Bill Bright did that with Robert Schuler. You remember that name? The Hour of Power. And he was going to have him as uh, one of his featured speaker at one of their great, big, huge... Um, well, it was going to be in a stadium, probably going to be forty to 50,000 people there. And all of a sudden, Schuler began to expose himself to Bill Bright, and Bill Bright said, wait a minute, this, this does not, said to himself, this doesn't sound right. So he brought in two of the best scholars in America, and they spent three hours with him in a closed room. And when they came out, they walked up to Bright and said, don't you dare let him up on the stage. This man is so far from the gospel that you just stay away from him. And that's the kind of thing that leaders are bound to do. They need to be checked out. Get your, get your, keep your, keep, keep a close eye on them. What are they talking about? And by the way, he says, turn away from them. No dialogue. Don't talk to them. And probably, in a sense of, of, um, don't provide a plat for them, platform for them, to pass off because you have, you have maybe new converts in your church who would be susceptible to their teaching. That doesn't even say anything about Mormons and Je Jehovah's Witnesses and people like that, right? It doesn't say anything about them. I'm not talking about them. We already know what they believe, and yet, uh, you know what, how does that happen? How does communism arise? How does humanism arise? 
How, how, how can you have Muslims who are so zealous for what they believe? Or Jehovah's Witnesses who go door to door to door to door to door? Or Mormons? How do, who do you think is behind all that? It's, this, it's the same guy. Satan himself. How in the world can a... How, how can the Mormons who, who've... Do you realize how much money they're worth? $600 billion. Billion. How, how could they, how could they, all these years, follow a 15-year-old boy that had crazy visions? Unless somebody locked him up early on and they fell into belief of it. Well, how does that, how do we, how do they overcome it? Well, look in verse 19. The report of your obedience has reached to all. I'm rejoicing over you. They need to continue in it. They need to continue in that obedience. As long as they applied their faith, they'd be okay. And they were in a, a moral wisdom. Notice he says, uh, the report of your obedience has reached to all, therefore I'm rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. So he didn't even want them to entertain that kind of a thought. What's the best way to uh, discover a counterfeit bill? Know what the real one looks like. Know what the real one really, really well, right? I remember, I remember there was a great big uh, banking deal in Texas years and years ago. They did the same thing for one solid week, hour after hour, and day after day. All they did was looked at real bills. And finally, the guy that was running the class, he said, I did this because you will know this so well, you can spot a counterfeit in an instant. Well, the book that they don't want to open, this will keep us from that kind of stuff. Father, we thank you so much that, that for us, your son Jesus Christ and your word of truth is everything to us. And the more we know your word, the more we will become conformed to the wonderful image of your son Jesus Christ. And that word will most surely keep us from error. We do have a responsibility. First of all, we have a Lord who is, who, who is um, over Satan, Christ himself. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. But we have certain things we need to do. And one of them is to keep our armor on every day. And to make sure I'm prayed up. That more than anything else will keep me from error. Lord, we know, maybe all of us in this room know somebody, somebody that's caught up in it. I thank you so much that, that Nathan was sharp enough to realize this couple was in over their heads. And you used him to get them out of that. There are, so, there are multitudes around the world in the same way. And the problem is this. When Satan gets his hooks into them, he takes them with him to the lake of fire because that's where he wants to go with them. Oh God, do your work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. We'll go back to First Thessalonians 3 next week.